Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Uh, we're going to do Ezekiel chapter 7. We're going to pick it up with verse 10 in a moment. Let, let me clue you in as to what's happening here. Our Father's unhappy. He's saying the end is coming. The end, the end is coming. In one verse so far in the first 10 verses, he has repeated that for emphasis. Now, uh, the fact is that the type here, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon's, on his way. He's going to besiege the city. And uh, he, he is the one God will use to take Judah, that 40 days he would lie on his one side, as we studied, for Judah. It's coming. And this also applies to the end times. Because the type is... Um, that Satan himself is called the king of Babylon in the great book of Revelation. The king of Babylon, he's on his way. At the end, he comes even before Christ does. And that's what the warning is about. And that's why Father says, I'm going to judge you by your ways. Have you read my letter? Are you familiar with the chronological order of events as to how they go down? Or are you going to be deceived? That's what it's leading up to. So you're going to have Nebuchadnezzar, that particular king of Babylon, would be converted. And in Daniel chapter 4, he wrote most of it. One of the most beautiful prayers in God's Word written by Nebuchadnezzar. But this second one, king of Babylon, being none other than Satan, watch out. So with that having been said, and the subject being the end coming, let's pick it up with some of the signs. Chapter 7, verse 10, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, uh, Behold the day. Behold, it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. Now, what's he talking about? The rod of correction is on his way. Nebuchadnezzar is marching. But also Satan is in this end generation. But what is this budding of the tree? When Jesus told you in, in the New Testament, he said, when you see the fig tree bud or shoot forth leaves, you better know it is time, it has come, that the second advent is about to transpire. So you're having a perfect setup here of a type of how it will be at that time. And certainly... Well, uh, when did that fig tree blossom like that if it's, uh, well, it blossomed in the year of our Lord, 1948. Both the good and the bad were set out. So it's past the morning, all right. We're getting on into the day, the last day. For Jesus would write in Mark chapter 13, when you see that parable of the fig tree come to pass, all prophecy will be fulfilled before this generation passes away. So, uh, that's a very important verse, so timely. Verse 11, violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs, neither shall there be uh, wailing for them. Right? They're going to be deceived. When the false messiah comes in the end times, there's going to be celebration. Rejoicing, dancing in the streets. Why? Well, why do you think he's called Antichrist? Because he's instead of Christ. They absolutely are so in such a stupor that they believe it is the messiah. That's what our father is trying to tell you here. And so... The, the rod of correction is to show ignorance can absolutely destroy you if you adhere to it rather than to the Word of God. 
Verse 12, the time is come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. What he's saying here, it is absolutely teeming. It's too, if you sell and get a good price, the king of Babylon is so close, you're not going to get to enjoy it anyway. And if you happen to make the pur purchase and buy something you really wanted, it won't, it's too late. Nebuchadnezzar is on his way at that time, the type, and I tell you, the Antichrist is on his way today. You're not going to get to enjoy it. We're living in that time when many of these things come to pass right before your very eyes. The thing is, have you read the word whereby you can recognize it when it does come to pass? Verse 13, For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. In other words, this, this word strengthen, in as much as Ezekiel means God strengthens me, what it's saying is sin will never strengthen you, it will destroy you. If you are deceived, and if you allow yourself to be caught up in this captivity of minds and spirits and souls, if you don't know the difference between the anti and the true Christ, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. What he's saying here, sin will never strengthen you. It will make a wimp out of you. Verse 14, they have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. Do you know why when the false Christ comes, why nobody's going to stand against it or go to war against it? They think it's Christ. Rather than war, they're going to rejoice. And you want to be prepared for many of your own kin will take part in that because of the deception. But God's elect have a destiny and a purpose. You must not be deceived. When God says He will do these things, He's talking about those that are easily deceived. You're not. Rather than finding the false Christ uh, tempting, you find Him to be an abomination. And He is a, an abomination. And here we come to the 40-year pan, the old bread pan. Verse 15, as we continue. The sword is without, and the pestilence and the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence, shall devour him. It's not a time for you to be deceived. This is Judah being attacked, okay? Jerusalem itself. And it's going to transpire. You know, this is written in another place. Do you know that? You'll find it. There, there is a song that God's elect is suppo they're supposed to know, and it's the song of Moses. Well, why should we know the song of Moses? Well, in Revelation 15, it says, if you overcome the Antichrist, the mark, the beast, and you overcome that system, you'll be singing that song. Well, why would you sing that song? Because it tells you how to overcome. It tells you line by line exactly how it's going down. And what's being quoted here in that very verse is Deuteronomy 32, verse 25, <clears throat> a portion of that song. And it reads like this, uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 25, the great song of Moses. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Going to deceive the whole bunch if you don't have the truth in your mind. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. And, and you know what? When you are turned away from God to the ways of man, you're a nothing. You're a non-person as far as doing God's work is concerned. 
Verse 27, Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should, um, lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. In other words, they'd try to take credit for it. I, I, I would correct them, but good. But they are his children, and he does want them to learn. But this deception is coming. It's not going to be a pretty sight. It shall transpire. And I, I would recommend that one take a home assignment of that entire 32nd chapter which pertains to the Song of Moses. The title you'll find in the last verse of chapter 31. The great book of Deuteronomy. Returning to Ezekiel chapter uh, 7 verse 16. But they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning every one for his iniquity. And that's in case any should escape. Do you know who will not have any part in this, though? Is God's elect. It's your destiny and purpose. And you've known there was more to God's word since you was a child than was being taught. Verse 17. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. Strength only comes from Christ. Strength, God is my strength. That's what the word Ezekiel means. Strength from, will not come from sin. Just the opposite, as we learned in that prior verse, sin weakens you, whereby you cannot stand. And if you go far enough into sin to be deceived and wallow in the waste of the Antichrist, then you're not fit. God won't even have you. When you go up to the big wedding feast and say, Lord, you don't understand. I'm a Christian. He'll say, I don't know you. You get away from me. I mean, you know, they're no longer a virgin. They were seduced by the false Messiah into his way of thinking. What a sad day that's going to be. You are strengthened by the word of God. Verse 18. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them. And shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. It's going to be a sad day when they recognize what has happened. You know, it is written in Revelation chapter 9 that when they realize they've worshipped Satan, they pray for the mountains to fall. They're too ashamed to face Christ. Just destroy us. They were good people, but they were a deceived people. 19. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowls, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. It is the stumbling block. Why? Because Christ can become that stumbling block when you're deceived by the Antichrist. Your love for Christ, if you haven't studied His Word, can cause you to worship the Antichrist because He says, I am Christ. And if you don't know any better, He is supernatural and he has great influence on the earth, many will, well, as a matter of fact, it says in the great book of Revelation, the whole world whores after him. That's how, that's how good he is at deceiving people. What it's saying here, I, I gave you silver and gold to line the, my sanctuary with, but you've used it for other things, to make your little idols and stuff, junk. It's become a stumbling block to you within itself in your deception, spiritually even speaking. Verse 20, As for the beauty of his ornament, he set it in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and of their detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. They take the things that should be worshiped well, I, 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 I worship, who, who, what do you worship most? Money? Do you worship, you know, even you can, if your car comes before God, you're worshiping it. If your home, if you, if you give up everything for your home and never take time for God, it becomes an idol. Whatever stands between you and God is an idol. 
And don't ever forget that. You better always have a little bit of time for the Father. Otherwise, He will see that things don't go real well for you. And you know, you always have that little part that'll say, well, things never go good for me. Well, it's understandable why. Okay. You've got to have God's blessings for things to go well. Verse 21, and I will give it unto the hands of the strangers for a prey and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil and they shall pollute it. Now, what you want to do is keep abreast of what's happening in this world. Do you know how much oil we buy from strangers? 700 billion a year. And they hate us. Many of them are at war with us. And <clears throat> you know, why, why is it, he said, uh, right there in that verse, um, strangers for, uh, into the hands of a stranger for prey. Do you know who holds a large portion of the mortgages that were bundled and in a great way and sold to foreign nations? Do you know how, do you know why the foreclosures have been stopped basically? It's for political reasons, but it's also the mortgages have been bundled into packages and sold overseas to strangers. And by the time you wake up to know America has been sold at, at uh, fire sale prices in the foreclosures, you better find out who's foreclosing because a lot of that paper, a large part of it is overseas among strangers. I wonder who your neighbor is going to be when all this gets settled. The real estate market in this nation is kaplunk. And if the foreclosures are stopped, it'll be worse than that. <clears throat> strangers will take it over. You could even have strangers in control. And that's a sad state of affairs. But it's biblical. It's written. Have you read it? It's not a pretty picture. No, it isn't. But when God says it's the end, the end, the end, the day has come, you better wake up. You better smell the coffee. You better look around you. How much we are giving away and how much we have been entrapped into giving away this great power that has always protected its people, its borders, I mean, has citizens shot down in cold blood at the very borders and nothing is done about it because of leadership. They'll do nothing. When you get a bunch of do-nothings in power and control, that's exactly what you're going to get done is nothing. Now, well, uh, you're kind of going into, po no, I, this is not politics. This is biblical. It's what it says right here. And if you think that those um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, um, packages, loans, abstracts, where do you think they are? Do you know why they can't come up with them? They're not in America. You want to wake up and, you know, he says, you, you've made so many sins, you can make a chain out of it and put all of you into bondage. Do you understand that? You can make prisoners out of yourself by your sins and lack of business opportunity, bad business. <clears throat> Verse 22, my face will I turn also from them. That's God speaking. And they shall pollute my secret place for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. I hate to tell you, but they're already there. Verse 23, make a chain for the land is full of bloody crimes and the city is full of violence. In other words, you make a chain and every one of you chain yourselves up, you're captive. Now understand what the type of this was, was Nebuchadnezzar was marching. He was on his way to take Judah and destroy Jerusalem. And I tell you this, 
if you want to know what is wrong with the monetary system, you need to read God's Word. And you need to read it carefully. But at the same time, you need to pay attention to current events. Because that chain can become very binding if you allow it. But God is still on the throne. And as long as God is on that throne and you listen to Him rather than man, you will be strengthened. That chain will snap in a thousand pieces and common sense will prevail. Verse 24, Wherefore I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. Who's got your mortgage, friend? I will also make the pomp of the strong to cease, and their holy place shall be defiled. They'll maybe send in a suicide bomber and blow their guts right out on the floor, you know. Well, the very worst of the worst, killing innocent people. 25. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. There's only one Prince of Peace. And he doesn't come when the false prince, so-called of peace, comes. But they're going to seek it. But that's why they're going to whore after the Antichrist, because that's his message. I'll make it all right for you. The conditions are right, my friend. The end could be right upon us. I'm not saying that to frighten anyone, but we're reading God's Word, not man's. And God is very serious about this. And the signs of the years and the days and the budding of the tree are upon us. I, I don't know, have you noticed it? Do you study it all from our Father's Word to know what He says is going to happen? Because you know why? That's exactly how it's going to be. These things have come to pass in this generation of the fig tree. You're living it. It's fun, isn't it? It is when you love Him and you escape because you have the truth and the knowledge and you're not seduced by lying uh, spirits to where you know the truth and you stand aside and allow God to use you to bring this back into control. <clears throat> and next verse, please. Verse 26. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. Why? They've all, um, the remnant has pulled away from them. Their religions have absolutely avoided the truth rather than teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. They're going to have a social. We'll, we'll go into God's house and have us a little social and everybody laugh. Everybody greet each other. Hi, how are you doing? Everything will be well. We'll have peace. Or will you? You'd better teach God's Word to God's children chapter by chapter and verse by verse if you want the blessings of God. Verse 27. The king shall mourn and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. I'm going to judge them according to their deserts. That's their sweet things, That's what they like. Not what God likes, but I'm going to punish them for their own misbeliefs, false teaching, and not following God's Word. It is a shame that every church cannot be familiar with what God's Word says about this very hour, this moment in time, this budding of the fig tree in 1948. As Christ, you know what Christ said in Mark 13? He didn't say, 
I think you should learn the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it. And he meant it for a very special reason. So that the generation that lived at that time could be tuned in to the word of God as to what's going down. Is this a time to despair? Of course not. Our Redeemer draweth nigh, but there's some bad things going down for those that are deceived. And God will judge them according to their ways. You want to make sure that your way is God's way, and that way is Christ. And then you're always set. These um, subprime um, loans that were let out, our government's still hooked for them. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, it's part of this. Strangers are buying them up. You might say, well, I, I thought our government was. Our, with what? They're having to borrow money from China. Well, then who really owns them? Well, where did the money come from, in part? But God is still in control. They're going to get their dessert that, that they think is so sweet it's going to come down on their very heads. That is a very potent chapter, and it is to give one some very serious thought into recognizing the hour that we are in and the love of Almighty God that He forewarns us about what's going down and what He intends to do about it. Chapter 8 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, and in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah, now who is this? I'm in my house. And the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Now here you've got it. He said, they're going to go to the priest and they're going to ask him. Well, here's, here's Ezekiel in his house. And here's the elders of Judah. This is, this is Jerusalem, at Jerusalem. And um, they're, they're going to seek some knowledge. What are, they, what are they going to find? Well, God will take care of Ezekiel first because he's been loyal. Verse 2, Then I beheld and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. God is a consuming fire. From the appearance of his loins even downward, that Shekinah glory glows. And from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. I mean, just like uh, the vehicles even appeared in chapter 1. 3, And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now, what, what has he said here? He took him spiritually to the second vision in, in this particular book. And he took him up above Jerusalem so he could look down and so he could see. And he said, look to the north. Well, what, what does that tell you? You should know. What is to the north? Well, if you've ever read Isaiah 14, you know that's where God's throne is. And you know that's where Satan is going to sit as the Antichrist. And that, that brings forth this jealousy we were talking about here. I mean, God is a jealous father. And can you blame him? But he's showing Ezekiel exactly one of the reasons that in especially the end time, why that God is unhappy with the children. I mean, not just a little unhappy, but a lot unhappy. When, when Satan sits in that seat in Revelation chapter 13, showing the world that he is God, then certainly um, that image to the north brings forth a jealousy and God will soon take action. Verse 4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, 
according to the vision that I saw in the plane. I mean, I could see him. So we're coming straight from the Father here. Don't read over it. Verse 5, Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar was the image of jealousy in the entry. That, uh, that that made God so jealous. You got Antichrist sitting there. I mean, there, there's all kinds of, of uh, sin that breaks God's law present that he's going to show Ezekiel. And let's go one more verse to complete this lecture. Six, he said, furthermore, Unto me, son of man, seest thou what, thou what they do? You look. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn you yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Yes, even than that. You know, our, our father is certainly disgusted when his pride and joy, his people, allow themselves to be snookered, and I mean snookered big time. And they need to wake up. God blesses America for a real special reason. He blesses America because he scattered, as he stated in today's lecture, I scattered those children. And he brought us together in a great land. And a superpower of superpowers, that's no accident. That's where those ten tribes mainly settled, and our Father blesses them. But you keep weaving that chain he's talking about, allowing strangers to take over, and you're going to be in a heap of hurt. See that you rise above it, that you stay away from it. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. You know why? We've got to judge, and boy, is he on the job. It's our Heavenly Father, and he judges real close. You do have the right to discern and keep your head out of the sand and discern what's going on around you. Don't start putting that chain together and imprison yourself. You have some good bolt cutters handy to break that chain as sonder when anyone even comes close to it. You're a child of God. He chose you before the foundations of this earth and you have a destiny. You stay free and above the fray because it's coming. We're in that time. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number or an address. Why? Well, God knows what you're thinking. He's the heart knower. So let him know what you want. Talk to him. That's what prayer is. It's not some long written thing by some psychic put together to try to impress people. He wants to know what's in your heart. Just talk to him, visit with him, tell him you love him. And it makes, it makes his day, and when you make his day, he's going to make yours. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father.
touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. And we've got Bill from Colorado. I would like to ask a question. Where and how do we spend the time, did we spend the time from the end of the first earth age until we had been born into the flesh of this earth age? In other words, where was I waiting around? Well, you, where did we come from? You, God said, let us make man in our image. We were with him. You were with him in paradise, wherever uh, waiting to come through the flesh age. Everyone must do it except the archangels. Uh, and, and to be with God in his presence is always a wonderful thing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth while you were with him. Shirley from California, question. A while ago, you mentioned a consecutive Bible which was written by a man named Please, and I think it was around the 40s. It apparently was not a popular for he stopped printing. No, no, uh, that's, it is, it's still in print. I think what you're being confused is it was Dr. Moffat. And, and you heard me say that the original edition, and it was in the 30s, if I remember right, in the 30s, he, used, he wanted to use the sacred name, Yahweh. But because people were so stuck with 1611, King James, he knew that if he used the sacred name at that time in the 30s, that it would not, it would, the whole Bible would be cast aside. They would not, and he wrote a letter of apology to scholars in the preface of that original uh, printing. But the Moffat Bible is still printed. I think probably the, the reason you use the word consecutive, I stated that Dr. Moffat arranges the scriptures in such a way. Many times when you're teaching God's Word, you know that a verse has been moved by a copyist. And, and Mo Dr. Moffat puts every verse back in its place, especially in the Minor Prophets. This becomes very important, and it's a good work for that cause. Moffat translation. It's still in print. Uh, James from Texas. You stated that Adam was not the father of Cain, but I read in Genesis that Adam and Eve had Cain, then later Abel. Please help me. Please explain. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, what does the Bible say? That's what's important. Chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between the woman's seed and Satan's seed and at, at the day of her conception when she was beguiled. You want to read... Um, what happened to Eve? Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. She was wholly, expatio, wholly seduced. And, and then Adam did know her, as it is written in 4.1. But you see, she had already conceived one son. She had twins because the second verse in the Hebrew manuscript state very clearly not that she conceived again, but she continued in labor. That word again means continued in the manuscripts. Doesn't mean that if the manuscripts say continued in labor. If a woman has one child and continues in labor, what is happening? Twins are being born. Now, <clears throat> document that a little bit. Well, it's real simple. You're not going to find Cain in Adam's genealogy because it wasn't his child. You're going to find Cain's genealogy in chapter 4 of Genesis and Adam's in chapter 5 in the last verse or so. But Jesus tells you who Cain's father was in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, as well as the parable of the tares in Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 35, hidden since the foundation of the world. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Arch from Kentucky. Is it better to be a, I've heard you say it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion, but yet you teach according to, according, a coward dies a thousand deaths. Well, that's, that's a figure of speech. He, he um, visually, I mean, he, he's frightened to death that many times. 
But a dead dog, I mean a dead lion is supposed to be, a lion is supposed to be king of the jungle. But if he's dead, he's just dead meat. He's going to go back to dirt and the dog still has metabolism going. And simplify. <clears throat> okay, Charles from Kansas. When people lived 900 years in the first earth age, did they, did that age uh, slower, did they age slower than we do now? Because I know how people look at 70 or 90 years old. I couldn't imagine what a person of 900, what, what, what if uh, it wasn't the first earth age? They were in spiritual bodies and they had eternal, they lived a lot longer than that. But in the beginning, why one like Methuselah could live to be 900 is there was no pollution. Man, I tell you what, we poison ourselves in this world today. There's pollution everywhere and uh, they had no problem living that long. But that was in this earth age, not the first. They weren't even in flesh in the first earth age. George from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Murray, I have a question about the word goads in Acts 25, 14. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Well, you're not using a King James Version, but that's okay. That's what it means anyway. Uh, 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 thank God we still have some farm boys around. A goad is a, I'm going to say a broom handle with a nail driven in the end of it, okay? That I'm just putting this in a language you can understand. And if you had a stubborn animal you were trying to drive and they got a little nasty with you, you goosed them with it. You know, not, not necessarily to penetrate the hide, but to let them feel it. Well, if one of them got a little touchy and kicked it, it would drive that nail right to the bone. And what Christ was saying, Paul, you're kicking against the goat. You're not hurting anybody but yourself, destroying the church, okay? That's, that's what it meant. And if you've ever been stuck with a goad, you'll know exactly what Christ meant. Um, Mary from New Jersey. <clears throat> Could you please explain Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, how is the kingdom of heaven likened unto the ten virgins, oil lamps, and the bridegroom? <clears throat> it's real simple. All ten of them made it to the eleventh hour. I mean, that's... They were all Christians right up to the end. But five of them never got around to learning the truth. They just played church. They never studied, never absorbed the Word of God. <clears throat> and when the false Christ came, evidently they jumped in the sack with him, which means they were no longer virgins. This is, I'm speaking spiritually now. They worship Satan. They wanted to borrow some truth at the, just a little too late, Charlie. And naturally, then Christ appeared. And they're still messing around with the false one, the other five. And when they come up to Christ and say, take us in, he said, I don't know you. Why? They were no longer virgins. They'd worship the devil. And Christ went way out of his way. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and many other places to warn people, don't be deceived by the false Christ. And then you expect him to take them in his arms when they will not listen time after time after time. Of course not. He's fed up with it. And they're going to learn the hard way. That's why you want to pay attention chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Robert from Florida. What is the white flag on Pastor Murray's left opposing the American flag? It's a Christian flag. Do you see the cross? I mean, if somebody could tip to it there a little bit um, with a camera, um, we'll see what we can do here. Up, up, and see that that's a Christian flag. It's, um, and um, that means church is taking place. If you're in a military post, that would mean church services are underway, okay? It's a Christian flag. Also, I would like to learn more about the split of the house of Judah and the house of Israel and how it relates to their location today. Well, it, it's quite important because 
the house of Israel, the ten northern tribes were taken captive by the Assyrian 200 years before Judah was taken in that uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, the split even of, of Ezekiel laying 390 days on one side and 40 on the other, because Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't keep them captive as long. The house of Israel went over the Caucasus Mountains, were later called Caucasians, settled Europe, and then migrated to Canada and America. And there you have the Christian nations making up those ten tribes. Uh, Helen from Texas, I have a question. Am I going to upset our father if I enter a church that preaches false doctrine to attend a funeral of a neighbor of mine, a dear sweet woman who may pass soon, and I don't want to, I do not want to pay my, I want to pay my respects. However, I would never ever want or purposely upset our father. It won't upset him. You're, you're a child of God. You're a daughter of God. You can go wherever you want to. You see, it's what you believe and what you support that counts. Paying your respect to that person is not supporting or respecting that work. It is respecting the person. You go in peace and, in, and, uh, and uh, love that neighbor. Uh, Lyle from Tennessee. I have been with the chapel since 1998. I am a disabled veteran, Vietnam 69 and 70. Question, what month does Satan turn out of uh, Virgo in 2012? Um, let me test my memory a little bit. It's December. Okay, I think I'm pretty sure it's de it is December, I'm sure. Uh, 2012. Seems like we got a lot of attention focused on that month, don't we? And year. Howard from Missouri. Thank you for your teaching. You are so welcome. Um, and, and I thank the people that keep you on the air. Well, that's all of you, and I appreciate it. And the Father is indebted to you for that. He loves you for it. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 21. Do I need to sell a cow and buy two sheep? I say, no, okay. It, um, it is good to, uh, if you're, if you do not do that, it simply means that um, um, this, this is a beautiful chapter in Isaiah. The 14th verse is actually the announcing of a virgin shall conceive and a child, a son will be born. You will call him Emmanuel. But, um, that, that is God's blessings of people that would have plenty. You keep those old cows and you'll be doing real good. Or, or, and the, not for spiritual reasons do you do that anyway. Uh, Nate from South Carolina. Your teachings have shown me what Jesus really means to me. And sometimes you go back to the same sin. I keep on asking God to forgive me for that sin. Is it wrong for me to keep on asking our Father for the same sin to be forgiven me? Please let me know. Well, seven times 70, he said, you forgive if you truly mean to repent. But let me suggest something. Why don't you talk to him about giving you the ability to stop that? Don't, don't just repent for it, but say, Father, I, I need to be honest with him. Just say, I need some help. I want you to touch me and give me the ability and show me how to, to beat this sin. Okay? Just talk to him about it. That's what prayer really is, is leveling with the Father, loving him, and knowing he's going to help you. Okay. But um, uh, you are forgiven when you repent. Chris from South Carolina, I understand that as I grow in knowledge of God's word and his plan, I am to spread the good news. However, most I encounter believe in the rapture and they listen little to what I have to say. Welcome to the club. My question is, am I doing enough to please God? Of course you are. Why? Well, the destiny of most Christians in this generation is to witness against the false Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up to the whole world. That, that's a purpose and what a purpose it is. Um, just, you know, if you find just one, just one person that will listen, is it not amazing that the word rapture is not even in the manuscripts and whole churches go with it? You know, even though what Christ is saying in First Thessalonians chapter 4, 
Verse 13 is if you believe Christ rose from the dead, you believe all the you better believe all the dead have risen with him already. They're gone. They're not out here in a hole in the ground. And at the last trump, which is the seventh, we will all change into a breath of life body and join them. Okay, that means a spiritual body. Eureka from California. What is your opinion of the recent UFO sightings over the nuclear plants over the world? Well, let's wait and get some actual facts on it and um, get it nailed down and then we'll go from there. Roy, Joy from Colorado. Pastor Murray, can you please explain in Genesis where it says you will bruise his head and she will bruise his head? Thank you. I love you. Well, you're, you're quoting uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God is talking to the serpent seed, the serpent and his seed. The serpent is simply one name for Satan. And what he's saying is that Satan's seed, which is Cain, the Kenites, are going to bruise the heel of Christ. They nailed him to a cross. It's one of the first prophecies in the Bible. But the end is coming up, and, and Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 is going to come to pass. Christ came to this earth to die on the cross, whereby in the final end he can destroy Satan, which is to say death. He's going to crack his nobbin, okay? He's going to, he's going to do away with him into the lake of fire. Uh, Lee from Mississippi, can you please explain more about the two witnesses and also about the nine priests they found buried in Tennessee? Well, the two witnesses, who appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? What did it mean? Well, it was Moses and it was Elijah. Elijah, the prophets, and Moses, the law. And uh, I know Elijah never died, and he's been with the Father. Many say Moses died. Well, God took him. Let's put it that way. He wouldn't let man touch them. Read the last chapter of what? Deuteronomy. And, and so it is. And all uh, the nine priests that were found in Loudoun County, Tennessee, at, the, at Bat Creek, they were buried there. Evidently, um, they had a work there, a ministry. And um, they had that stone that was in perfect Hebrew that made the statement that I forementioned, let the, lion of tribe, let the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, be the poker that draws these firebrands back to him. Real priests of God are called firebrands in, in um, Zechariah chapter three, if I'm not mistaken, another place. Let me think a moment. Um, they're called firebrands also in Psalms 104. David from Minnesota. What exactly is Satan's de facto? Um, I think probably you are talking about sometime when I said that Satan would come de facto. De facto is a legal term that means he will force his way in person. Okay. De jure is when one takes something over that is rightfully his, which is Christ comes de jure, Antichrist comes de facto. Okay. He forcefully tries to take it. Um, I hope that helps you, all right? Bill from South Carolina. Would you please explain, would you explain Revelation chapter one, verse 14? Thank you. Well, it means purity, okay? Uh, Rick, it was, it's a describing Christ in the spiritual form with the Shekinah glory around him. Uh, Nick from Missouri, what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is in your forehead, as it is written in Mark chapter 13, um, Revelation chapter 13. What's in your forehead, your brain is. And if you worship Satan, the rapture doctrine is a great lead into that, because that's Satan's message. He's got that down pat. It began in the year of our Lord, 1830. And it was, even though the word's not in God's word, and, and it was latched on to by a brethren, two of them, and they, they have spread it all over. And so the mark of the beast is to have your mind deceived by Satan until you worship him. In your hand means you're deceived more than that. You even do his work. You help him build his church. 
you know, if you help Satan build his church, don't expect the real Christ to take you in. He won't. Uh, Leela from New Jersey. I have buried both my children, one granddaughter, and I have a disabled husband. How can I find scripture that will give me courage and strength and that um, things will get better? All of God's word. Of all people, you need all of it. But I do have one verse for really troubled times that I like for you to have. You know, first of all, uh, Leela, they're with the Father. And you know, that's not all bad. I know you miss them, but you want to be thankful too. There's no more pain, they're with Him. And, um, but make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Memorize it. It'll help you when you're down. Cheryl from uh, Georgia, where is Satan today? Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, he's in heaven until Michael and his angels cast Satan and his angels out onto this earth de facto. Okay. And um, that's when he appears in person as the false Christ. And I see that I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. You know something? It makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. He sends us a letter letting us know exactly how it's going to be. That's why you want to absorb it. So please don't ever forget to thank Him for it. Won't you do that? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important though, I want you to discipline yourself. You stand for something. You stay in His Word every day. In His Word is a good day even with trouble. You know why? Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.